Welcome back to the studio. We are in conversation the next 30 minutes with Dominique Day, Executive Director of Daylight. And as usual, post your questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Dominique, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for including me here. Dominique, to start, can we get an introduction from you and tell us a little bit about the work you do? Okay. Uh, I am a human rights and civil rights attorney. I sit on the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, and I run a program called Daylight, which is a racial equity accelerator. We look at intersectional racial justice, so racial justice through the lenses of um, youth, women, people of color, uh, 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 LGBTQ people, and others to make sure when we're thinking about race, we're thinking coalitionally, and when we're thinking about equity, we're looking at everybody. That's a big, big thing to tackle. Can you give us a little bit more? Um, what are some of the things that you're working on right now? So I, we just finished, in the UN, we just finished our public session. We were looking at the rights of the child of African descent and the ways in which people's racialized thinking, legacy mindsets of enslavement and the, slave, the trade and trafficking and enslaved Africans, colonialism, continue to perpetuate um, really problematic decision-making today. So the ways that children are adultified, black girls are hypersexualized, the way that we make assumptions about what people are entitled to heavily based on our legacy mindsets around race, exploitability, expendability, and the disposability of black folk. And so what are the things that you can do to try to counter that? You've identified the problem. Uh, you've mentioned that you're an attorney. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, the opportunities are endless. You know, we understand that the social conditioning of race extends as far back as the social construct of race for the trade and trafficking and enslaved Africans. So we're talking about hundreds of years of almost deputized racism being built out in different sections. And so it's really interesting in the tech sector, you see a lot of people saying, that's a weird problem. Here's a tech solution to this. And so you've seen, if you looked at, for example, in New Jersey, in the US, the force report, um, a bunch of young uh, activists uh, with computers managed to do a massive yield of Freedom of Information Act information to show how police, for example, with um, the highest number of force complaints were also the highest decorated and awarded. At the same time, you know, you see other tech solutions that are highly racialized once we look at them, but harder to dismantle. Um, maybe an example of this right. just the other day. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no. definitely. Please give, give us the example. You know, there's a new article that came out just the other day in the Journal of American Medicine um, that showed that pulse oximetry, the, the little light things we've been all downloading on our phones to figure out our oxygen during COVID, and that was used as a metric of whether or not to admit people to the hospital, has systemic racial disparities uh, for Black and Latino patients and actually impacted dramatically who received treatment, when they received treatment, and who ultimately was able to live with and survive this disease. And so it's really interesting how much we need to confront our own bias in order to actually ensure our tech solutions are uh, equitable, um, uh, even, even, uh, even when unconscious to ourselves. Now, this, this intersection of tech, COVID, and race is something that a lot of people have talked about over the last uh, two years of this pandemic. Um, it's really tricky. What are some of the issues and the challenges that's making it difficult for tech companies to move more quickly on this? I mean, if you want my honest answer, race is uncomfortable. Race can be expensive. Race can be something um, that confronting it, we have, we have research on this, can be psychologically devastating. So before the pandemic, we had research that said emergency doctors make anti-Black, pro-white decisions when they're overwhelmed and stressed and have too many patients. And yet that wasn't factored into policymaking. Before the pandemic, we knew a pandemic would be disproportionately devastating to Black and Latino communities. And yet that was not factored into policymaking. The racial disparities we, see, we saw throughout the pandemic often fail to really guide policymakers, tech companies, and even social solutions. 
Um, and then we've also seen a real disregard of innovation, right? And um, uh, there's a, this COVID uh, treatment in, uh, that a Ugandan doctor came up with, ignored by the rest, the West. Mm. African innovation, ignored by the West, in favor of very expensive solutions that are uh, uh, often accessible only to those of us in the North. And so I think that space confronting the realities of systemic racism requires a level of self uh, uh, scrutiny mm -hmm. that has been prohibitive for people. And Dominique, you mentioned this uh, medical research in Uganda. I haven't heard of it. Perhaps a lot of the audience haven't. Can you talk a little bit about that just so we know what you're referencing? Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> and I'm not a doctor, mm -hmm. but as I understand it, there's mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a it's a liquid spray called Covidex. It was developed and it was a fairly effective treatment for, uh, as it's been told to me, the kind of COVID you get in your throat, not so much in your lungs. And this was something that was ultimately approved by the government in Uganda, has been uh, used throughout this period, and in fact was protected by the developer from being instrumentalized into a highly profit-making in intervention. And the idea was to give it to people and to give it to people widely and to avoid um, any massive barriers to access. Um, at the same time, you know, we've seen a lot of very expensive solutions stood up and protected both by the media and by our governments. The idea that there's really viable innovation coming out of Africa, coming out of other spaces that provide um, cheap, affordable, and effective solutions has been disregarded. And you have to ask yourself why. At the period that COVIDx was being first piloted, we didn't have any solutions on the table. We didn't have vaccines on the table. And yet African innovation was looked at, even in this area where people like me have been talking about the enduring power of systemic racism for years, African innovation was still seen as though it's people somewhere in the global south playing in a sandbox, rather than real innovation grounded in a continent's understanding that only they will save themselves. And the way that that's been offered to us, um, it's almost disappointing that we haven't been able to really leverage um, our claims of understanding equality, understanding the intelligence that exists in every space. We haven't been able to leverage that into action. Now, over the last two years with the pandemic, there has been more discussion, I would say, um, uh, in terms of, of race. For example, I think a lot of Americans did not necessarily understand the reason why certain groups had hesitancy around the vaccine because of historical uh, reasons. Um, do you think that kind of stuff has been internalized and that there's been at least some improvement moving forward or you're looking at a pretty dismal picture? I mean, I don't know that I would say that there's been improvement, right? Mm. And partially is that's because I don't know that I would say that people's trust didn't come from a very real place. I was recently in Switzerland doing a country visit and very many of the meetings we had to have couldn't take place in government buildings because a surprising number of people of African descent there had not been vaccinated and had chosen not to be vaccinated, right? And in the, in the, in the, in even given the opportunity. This partially had to do with an enduring legacy that uh, had told them that they may not be safe in the hands of the state, but it also had to do with the reality of current policy that tolerated, that suborned entrenched discrimination and entrenched inequality. And so just like here in the U.S., when you have ongoing policies of discrimination, ongoing policies that tolerate risk to Black and Brown communities, ongoing policies that deprive childhood to Black and Brown children, it may be harder and harder to dismantle people's reference point of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, for example, even if it's not a perfect analogy. It may be harder to dismantle that reference point when people look around and they see um, what they feel is evidence of ongoing governmental disregard. That said, plenty of black and brown doctors have, have worked really hard to push out the vaccine. I, of course, am vaccinated, mm. but I have to tell you, this is not just an American problem. Black people all over the world have felt a real hesitancy to um, believe that the government will provide a solution where so often it has failed them in way, even as it has stepped up for others. You talk about um, challenges that uh, people of African descent face, not just in the United States. And, and um, we are 
two years after the death of uh, the murder of George Floyd. And um, your work being so transnational, I certainly know being based in Berlin, actually, that's where I'm usually, I usually am, um, that the Black Lives Matters protests extended beyond the US borders. And there were a lot of people in European capitals, including in Berlin, uh, across the continent there, uh, going out to speak uh, for racial justice. And I, I, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Um, number one, why do you think that was the case that uh, BLM and the protests in the United States sparked protests? Even in Tokyo, I remember, people came out. And, and do you think the role of social media, of course, had anything to do with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think social media has been, for all of its challenges, has, has revolutionized our world, is defining a new generation. And still, I think a new generation is not going to help, it's not going to be able to rid us of racism. You know, we saw, we saw protests in virtually every capital in the world. And I think part of it um, may have been in solidarity, but I think a lot of it also had to do with people of African descent and others both experiencing analogous situations in their own country at the hands of their own police at the state and people in every country not wanting that to be the narrative anymore. That even people who didn't see themselves as potentially at risk from the police no longer want to be associated with um, this entrenched uh, systemic racism, whereas where black bodies are seen as wholly dispensable to the point of uh, the impunity that was associated with the um, the audacious murder of George Floyd. And I, I think that's meaningful, right? Because at the same time that we were seeing protests everywhere in the world, we were hearing reports, Brazil, Colombia, Spain, the UK, um, escalated police actions, particularly in black communities. I mean, obviously the US as well, where it was almost as though the stress of COVID was being released and relieved on the bodies of black communities. And that space, I think, created a powerful nexus, a powerful through line, um, race as a powerful through line between COVID police brutality and protest that actually extended around the world. And so I do think it was a special moment and I'm struggling with the fatigue that um, many companies seem to have achieved at this point in terms of their commitment to substantive change. And you mentioned law enforcement. So I know a specific focus of yours is how the use of facial recognition technology and biometric surveillance in policing has disproportionately impacted uh, Black communities. Talk about that. Well, you know, it's interesting, right? Um, I'm a lawyer, so I've been a lawyer for about 25 years. I used to lit I used to be a public defender, and so I would litigate police operations, right? The legality of a police operation that ultimately resulted in the arrest of my client. And in that process, you know, on some level, a police officer is testifying that they want to catch a person committing a crime. And yet somehow artificial intelligence products become commercial products on the market with racial disparities initially, right, of up to 30, 40%. We saw black women misidentified 35% um, of the time uh, just a few years ago with facial uh, recognition uh, products, uh, misgendered and mis misraced, I should say. And that space where somehow the production of a commercial product has, and even earlier, like I was talking about pulse oximeters, a production of a commercial product has literally ignored the risk to black folk of being misidentified by a potential um, drone carrying plane that could literally drop a bomb on our heads. The risk to black folk of walking through the airport and being potentially misidentified, the fact that that could be disregarded in a commercial product is so unthinkable. It reminds us how deeply, deeply foundational systemic racism is in America, but also transnationally, right? From, the, from its inception, we have pushed out um, the construct of race in the trade and trafficking of enslaved Africans. And now we have another space, right, where we're pushing out tactics, policies, and equipment, including digital AI equipment for law enforcement. We're pushing it out across the world from the United States. And that space continues to reflect enduring racial legacies and requires really rigorous, immediate attention.
So I guess the next question is a big one. Uh, maybe you can look at it a narrow version, uh, sort of pot slice of it. But what can be done? Uh, I think I know the answer for uh, the second question, which is uh, have tech companies been receptive uh, to this kind of feedback? I'm guessing not as much as you would like. So then what can be done? Yeah, so much can be done. I, when I say not as much as I would like, I would say that there are a lot of people who are interested in a training, but are people interested in a deep audit of their practices? Are they interested in mapping where the holes are? The expertise to fix these problems exists inside the systems where they survive. So, um, you know, a lot of press was given recently to the uh, denial of kidney transplants for Black people unless they were much sicker. Mm -hmm. That issue was something that was seen, understood, and uplifted by people within that field. You didn't go and hire um, a racial justice person to say, let me just look at all of your protocols. Somebody who understood the protocol and had a sense it was racist came to talk to someone like me and to figure out how to actually articulate the connection between an existing medical protocol of today that's been stripped of all its racialized content and the legacies of our racialized history. And so that expertise, it exists in every field. It exists in every office. It exists in every newsroom. And that's something that needs to be actually leveraged. But those voices are voices that have overwhelmingly been disregarded, that haven't been mentored, that are lesser promoted, that are lesser recognized as valuable, and whose discourse is often um, limited to putting our faces uh, up front when a race issue shows up. So some of it is about how do you actually acknowledge or build the expertise to take a critical look um, inside of every system, right? R systemic racism is about growing racism in systems. And some of it is about make your racial interventions look less like a pronouncement of Black Lives Matter and right. more like a rigorous dismantling of, uh, of, of, of what's already there, a rigorous interrogation of how your discomfort may be a barrier to the kind of equity and equality you claim to uh, value and, and be striving towards. And Dominique, we're gonna get to questions very soon, but I wanted to perhaps end on a brighter note for this uh, segment of our conversation. You talked about African innovation earlier, um, and I wonder if we can circle back and, and give you the opportunity to talk a little bit more. And how do you think um, this innovation can be shared to the world? Uh, you say that there's systems in place that make it so that it's difficult for people to pay attention. So what are some of your suggestions for people to better understand what's happening? It's, it's, it's a young continent. There's so much uh, knowledge and so much learning being done there uh, that I think it's super interesting and a lot of people listening probably wanna learn more. I guess I would say it's an old continent and the reality is that people have often um, uh, taken a lot of responsibility for how they tackle a problem. Um, Africans did well in COVID. I mean, this is sort of a really broad brush for a really big continent, but did well in COVID because of the experiences of the prior pandemics, because of the sense of community, and because of the belief and reliance on innovation that existed. And so um, I think, the first thing, if the West wants to look at Africa as a country in the way that we often do, the first thing would be maybe to see, think about it less extractively, right? How do we actually understand on an equal playing field with an equal level of respect and an equal willingness to share profit, power, and privilege? How do we understand African innovation as um, necessary to and um, uh, equal to uh, Western innovation? And then how do we actually uplift rather than um, squelch solutions that are actually grounded in mutual aid? The, um, you know, uh, we saw in Cuba during COVID a tremendous amount of mutual aid being pushed out. We saw in uh, the COVID X vaccine I was telling you about mm -hmm. a tremendous spirit that this was not going to be something that one doctor was able to leverage into enormous profit, but instead something that would continue to benefit community. That spirit, that spirit of mutual aid, of, uh, of we are all one, of we are accountable to each other, 
cannot and should not be placed up against the idea of intellectual property or the idea of wealth accumulation. Instead, should be respected and valued and given primacy, if not, you know, equality, if not primacy. Great. And just to clarify, when I said young continent, I wasn't clear. I meant demographically. Um, We will go to questions now. The first one is from Isedua. How can we push companies to go beyond DEI initiatives? It seems that many companies just point to the existence of the initiative as a sufficient indication they are working to address systemic racism in their business operations or services. Absolutely. And in fact, there's research that, um, you know, there's a moral licensing effect. People appoint a chief direct, uh, chief diversity officer and ultimately feel like they've done enough. And eventually that person reports to somebody lower and lower and lower until they walk away if they actually are invested in the integrity of their, of their work. And, and, and that is something that needs to be driven internally. So, I mean, I would say that there has been a real investment in superficial um, language of solidarity in virtue signaling and book clubs and uh, getting everyone's awareness up to a certain level. And there's probably some value in that. And yet, as I was saying, in each of these areas, in each of these fields, in each of these systems, the way that racism actually operates to exclude, to minimize certain people, to diminish certain voices, to limit innovation, right? To to focus much more on incrementalist thinking than real innovation that might require a really disruptive, uh, critical eye. That's something that that expertise exists within. The idea of what it is to include rather than assimilate exists within. And those are conversations that require some discomfort, some listening, and also the uplifting of voices that are often delegitimized. And so I think that is something that needs to be, there needs to be demand from within in certain companies. And also perhaps there needs to be a real reckoning with what are the costs? of business as usual. What are the costs of incrementalist thinking? As my father used to call it, he was a he was an inventor and an innovator mm. and worked for a big corporation, right? And also, and so this was the biggest insult you could have in my childhood, that you were an incrementalist thinker. And yet in the diversity space, we see how um, strongly the desire is that diversity personnel protect management from lawsuits rather than truly create an inclusive and innovative community. And that's something that the dissatisfaction with that needs to be resoundingly heard within and often by the people whose fame, whose power inside these systems um, could possibly drive a change in conversation. And as you say, it makes them uncomfortable. Uh, Liana asks, what is a trend that you're noticing in terms of surveillance, like how it physically manifests? Uh, She says, I think digital rights issues, particularly their effects on marginalized communities, can um, have a barrier to understanding. It's a type of police violence that's not immediately visible and happens behind closed doors. Absolutely. And increasingly behind closed doors, right? This is the problem with artificial intelligence for all the amazing things it's giving us. It's harder and harder in courts and in communities to really unravel um, what surveillance is actually happening and what's driving it. And so, you know, I think for uh, racialized people, for people whose ancestors were subject to the terror and the surveillance and the control of enslavement and and the post-slavery period, you also have this recognition that this is a bit more of the same, right? The idea that um, getting my my retina scanned almost every time I cross a border um, doesn't feel like a big invasion of privacy to some. And yet there are those of us who understand that's a form of surveillance that could immediately be converted into violence because it has been um, and because it continues to be. And so I think perhaps, um, you know, we're in a different moment where privacy means something very different Mm. to the younger generation than it does to the older generation. But surveillance and the idea that you, um, your ability to walk through the world, your liberty means something very different if you're black versus if you're white, that that is something that younger generation really gets. And so to me, the different definition of liberty based on your race, the idea that the next door app is popping off every time a black person is walking through the neighborhood and the neighbors are out there craning um, is a different form of liberty, a different form of, of stress, of racial stress you're asked to take on. And that space, 
um, has, has only increased, even though perhaps the image of the police officer in the cruiser or the police officer on the beat stepping, stepping to you directly may not be as apparent in some communities. That surveillance we know is feeding, um, uh, it's feeding weaponry, it's feeding airports, it's feeding who gets, um, who gets targeted in all sorts of uh, ways that are deeply problematic from a human rights standpoint. And I say deeply problematic, but obviously I mean inhumane and atrocious. Right. And that space of surveillance, um, is it, it's a blanket at this point, and it's a racialized blanket. And so I think as the discomfort with, oh, it's just the police asking for your identification, um, doesn't feel like a big deal to folks, they can look very easily and see what surveillance policies lead to in terms of drones, in terms of airport detentions, in terms of um, the ways in which people may be detained with or without counsel, mm-hmm. with or without notice to their family. And, and so maybe you have to dig a little deeper, but it's an important amount of digging to do because the surveillance and control of Black bodies is as foundational to America as apple pie, probably more so. And Liana asks, uh, defund the police is gaining traction. Do you have any advice on how activists can push to defund surveillance tech weaponized by police? Uh, And what are you seeing as a pressure point? Companies and politicians don't have many incentives to address surveillance tech. Is it um, risky to companies' bottom lines or is it bad PR or something else that will help push the needle forward? Um, and I guess there's also some debate whether defund the police is gaining traction. Yeah, I think this is another one of these areas where it seems to be going up and down with um, uh, with, with what's in the media. And I have to say, um, I, like most lawyers who know what they're doing, we're trying to actually take our talking points from the activists, from the youth, from the voices on the, on the ground, right? Um, it's problematic if I'm sitting in the UN, um, uh, not reflecting what I'm hearing in my own communities. And so I think in terms of defund, I'm hopeful that the conversation that's happening, which is that the police are a remarkably ineffective intervention against um, mental health challenges, a remarkably ineffective intervention against the uh, sort of punishing of adolescents that has them pushing a lot of kids into the school to prison pipeline who would actually age into really lovely adults with a little adolescent horseplay, which is not just normal, but biological, it turns out. We have really great research on this. Mm. And so to me, the defund platform is really grounded in a demand for community as we always knew community until more recently and a demand for accuracy. You know, when we're talking about funding or money, we look at metrics and we say, are you succeeding? And yet the war on drugs has succeeded in nothing beyond Mm. criminalizing a generation of black and brown men, certainly hasn't succeeded in reducing the proliferation or even the impact of narcotics. And so in that space where the police are often um, achieving a metric that is not the metric they're supposed to be uh, achieving, which is prevention of community uh, crime and protection of community safety, you have to ask yourself who's actually profiting, who's actually benefiting. And in this space, it's very clear that community interventions, particularly if they're going to be state community interventions, don't actually need to criminalize people in order to be effective, just the opposite. They need to support both innovation and education, um, no matter how people learn. And that includes creating spaces Mm -hmm. for people to have neurodiverse interventions and become really beautiful powerful contributing members of our society rather than you know that autistic kid who was killed on his lawn by the police dominique day uh thank you so much for joining us this has been an amazing 30 minutes and i'm sure that's the case that the audience feels this way as well we've had a lot of engagement in the chat box and we really appreciate that you joined us here thank you so much i appreciate the invitation thank you so much That's it from the studio for now. As always, stay engaged and enjoy your sessions.